the Wiston Lake. Okay. I'll call to order the September meeting of the Finance Committee. We will begin with the consent agenda. Are there any items that anyone would want pulled from the consent agenda? Ms. Burke. Uh, C2 and C3, and I believe I uh, said C9. I, they're going to bring my book, another book up. So I got down 2, 3, and 9. Yes. Ms. Adams? C2 and 3. I'm, I'm okay. I had C6. Did you have any? Okay. Is there a motion to approve the balance? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed likewise. Those are approved. We will begin the consent items with C2. If you'll read that, please. Item C2, resolution authorizing operation of Spring Street Apartments as permanent housing and authorizing amendment of financing terms. Item continued from the August meetings of the Finance and Community Development Housing General Government Committees. Mr. Brooks, would you mind coming forward, or if I see your name at the top here, and give us just a few comments on this? Good afternoon, Chairman, committee members. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. This item is a resolution that uh, would authorize the Spring Street Apartments to be converted to permanent housing by ESR. There was a rehab loan and an acquisition loan made on this property several years ago. Uh, in compliance with their earlier request, we tried to provide information in a very simple form. So the acquisition loan, there is a, the original loan was 65000 balances balance is 65000 That would be forgiven on 12-31-24, or if the property is sold or transferred. The remaining balance on the rehab loan is 27000 and uh, ESR is requesting that that balance be forgiven at this point. Uh, it would continue to provide housing, but on a permanent basis. Okay. Ms. Burke, you have this one. Do you have any specific questions you'd like? I just wanted to be uh, taken out so we can have a discussion. And I would like to say also, it's indirectly, uh, ESR did celebrate their 50th anniversary, and they have been really a good partner in this community. In fact, I believe the cross section of this community has people have supported it. And the fifty years they've spent here, we can see things that have done to make lives the lives of individuals better. So that's why I wanted that brought up, Mr. Chairman. Um, and to make sure that we let them know I appreciate what they do. Okay. And we do have some representatives from ESR present. Okay, thank you. If there's any questions, thank you. Uh, Ms. Adams, did you have a comment or question? Yes. Um, again, um, to ditto what uh, the Mayor Pro Tem just said, uh, we recognize all the good work that ESR uh, has done in the community. But again, when these types of projects, uh, Mr. Brooks comes to us, um, I, I, I would like to see, you know, over the years, if we can get some information, again, how many people they've helped. I think the public would do good to know that. And I know they have that data. Uh, so I think, you know, going forward, I would like to see that even, uh, I'm going to support it. But going forward, I'd like to have that information. Well, do. Mr. Montgomery had a comment. Yes. Uh, my question is in reference to the affordability. I see that it states that based upon the home funds, that affordability requirement expired in 2008. For me, um, transitioning from property that's going to be used for transitional housing to now permanent housing, um, I have a concern that there will no longer be an affordability requirement on the property. Yes, the home of affordability period did expire and there will be no mandated affordability period and I guess the best response that I could give you on that would be the population that they serve they're going to be limited in the rents that they can charge based on the population that they're serving. Uh, but this doesn't say that they are only going to serve their population because it doesn't mean that they could rent it to anybody that wanted to live there because it, or are we constraining it to the use of No, they would still, there? they could not rent, they will not be renting, it's my understanding they will not be renting to just anyone. They will still be renting to the same population. Well, I would like to, that to be in, 
in the terms of it because if you go outside of that then you're to me it doesn't necessarily stick to the original intent and use even though you move from transitional to permanent if you're serving the same population the affordability piece to me still remains of concern okay so, so I understand you are interested in having something in the loan documents that would ensure that there is that saying the scope of the original intent of the loan is still met. Right, and it doesn't necessarily have to say a dollar amount on for a bill, but mm -hmm. that they're still serving that population. Yes, sir. Is there someone here from ESR who could comment on that? Please come forward. If you'll go to the microphone. If you please give your name and address for the record, please. Yes, uh, good evening. My name is Jennifer Castillo. I work with Experiment and Self Reliance. Um, did you just my address? Yeah, oh, your company address. Oh, Experiment in Self Reliance, uh, 4280 Dominion Boulevard is our new building. Um, and uh, Ms. Wellman Roebuck, she, she does send her regards. She could not be here today, but me and Ms. Barbara Johnson are here in her place. Um, and uh, I think I can just offer a little bit of clarity. I work specifically with the housing department, so I'm one of the case managers that actually puts um, residents into our Spring Street units. And one of the things that we've been talking about is doing, going to the other apartments in the area and looking at what their rents are just to make sure that we are still offering uh, fair market rate units or units that are consistent with uh, fair market rates around that area. And our units are set to specifically what we want to do is open them up um, to the shelter plus care recipients to the uh, rapid rehousing uh, population that we're working in concert with uh, United Way's 10-year plan. So now that the, uh, a lot of the case managers are sending uh, rapid rehousing clients, that would open us up to be able to offer that housing to them so they won't have such a hard time getting approved by other landlords. Yeah, on the, the fact you said in terms of fair market, to me that doesn't necessarily state to be affordable um, but more so just in line with the market in that area and so that's just my question in terms of the population that's being served ensuring that there's not a overburden by going to the market rate that's in the area based upon that that could change over time right. and how that impacts the individuals that's there right and definitely and we would definitely have to take that into consideration we will be taking that into consideration specifically like he mentioned because of the population that we serve so we are aware that we couldn't necessarily go too high over what the fair market rates are regardless Ms. Burke had a yeah, question. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee and others assembled a question like that to me it seems like the director there should be some conversation mm -hmm. before we would say it is really what's going to be and I would feel a little more comfortable if we're not in a big rush if if we can get the answer before the meeting, but if we cannot get the answer, can we just make sure we get something from mm -hmm. the director? Yes, ma'am. Actually, uh, the information that we don't have or that we can't give 100% um, answer on, I'm taking it back to Ms. Wellman Roebuck, and she'll get back with you as well. I understood. The question is, under the previous financing arrangement, there was a written commitment for, quote, affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And that's going away. So can we put something? Put in a there? new clause in there yes, to like make that. sure that it's affordable versus yes. fair market. But yes. we want to make sure affordable. Yes. Yes. And I think that has a legal definition. Okay. Ms. Adams. Yes. And I think, and maybe this might not be what we're looking for, but I thought I remembered reading that on C2 on page 77. At the bottom, it says, by converting the Spring House, uh, Spring Street apartments to permanent housing, ESR would be able to make the units available to rapid rehousing program referrals, shelter plus care program referrals, disabled homeless, holders of vouchers under other programs and other households seeking affordable rental units. ESR services would be provided to tenants based on needs. Um, again, based on what they're saying, and I think we kind of under we understand. The way ESR operates, I've never known them in the history, Ms. Burke, and any of us to rent to anybody outside of people that are in need, affordable housing, homeless, veterans, disabled. And I don't think that mission is going to change. Uh, I think what they're doing is enhancing their housing stock based on the federal new regulations about uh, providing uh, transitional housing 
uh, just like we're seeing with our homeless programs and, and the continuing of care and all of that, the government and everybody finally saw that, you know, we got transitional housing and that's what it's doing. It's now, later, now, later. We now need people because we've lost so many jobs and the economy changed for a lot of families. We need permanent housing for these families and people. But I think it's in there, but if the council member wants that in the, the, the language, uh, I'm in agreement with it, but I, I see that it is listed in your uh, your request proposal. Okay, Mr. Montgomery again. Mm -hmm. Oh, excuse me, uh, Mr. McIntosh was next. Is, I'm, I'm, can, I'm wondering about the timing of this. Is there a trigger event that's occurred? Yeah. Why now are we changing the financing on this? I can't answer too much on that. That would probably be more for our executive director, but I do know part of uh, with the tenure, the tenure plan and the hearth guidelines coming down from HUD, they're preferring more to fund uh, more of the long-term permanent housing programs. And then some of the stipulations with rapid rehousing as well, um, they have to have permanent housing. So if we wanted to place some of the rapid rehousing clients that we have right now into our units, because of the transitional housing label that it has right now, we're not able to do that. But if it changes to permanent housing, we can open it up and then meet the HUD guidelines. It, 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 is this time sensitive? If we delayed it a month, would that mess you up? Uh, I can't answer that definitively. I don't think that it would, but I would okay. probably have to take that back to our executive director. All right. Well, <laughs> you may not have a choice in a minute. <laughs> Go ahead. Ms. Uh, uh, to answer uh, Councilmember McIntosh's question, I'm on the, uh, that board. And in fact, they have found uh, by using rapid rehousing rather than transitional housing that the, homeless, the homelessness numbers are drastically reduced. Mm -hmm. And so it has. Uh, serve to be uh, a, a great tool in uh, getting people into permanent housing as fast as possible and providing the services to them in their homes. Does that require a change in the financial setup? Yeah, that's from I guess it requires this def change in well, Let me ask Ms. Mr. Brooks. They are changing from a, I guess, more of a temporary to permanent type housing situation. Does that trigger something in the funding that requires us to change the? No, it doesn't trigger anything in the funding. And I think council member um, ooh, Light's response is correct under the Hearth Act. The whole focus now is changing from transitional and rapid housing to permanent housing under the Hearth Act. As you uh, had approved earlier with the new continuum of care and the way that whole board is now being transitioned. So in terms of why, I think that's the reason why you see this, because they have determined that it's a better method of housing individuals as opposed to the transitional type of housing that uh, has been in existence but for the past. Do they need the city council to approve that change? They need city council to amend the terms of the loan. Right. Because the loan is for temporary housing? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, Mr. Montgomery, do you have another comment? I did, but I think I might have forgotten it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but that big job you got on there. So but to me, I, I, if I may interrupt you, I think Mr. McIntosh has brought up something legitimate. There's two issues here. One is our permission to go from a temporary to a permanent type housing situation. The other one is whether or not we want to change the funding. Right. That's what I'm hearing. Right. Uh, I'm going to suggest to the committee that we move it forward without recommendation and then that gives you a week to get Ms. Roebuck to uh, get back with us on the, the issue. I agree. Are there any issues from a council standpoint? That's it doesn't seem to be a lot of issue between going from temporary to permanent. Is there any issues or questions concerning the change in the financing arrangement? No. Okay. I, re I remember now. It was just a comment. I know uh, Councilman Adams mentioned that um, it is listed here in terms about affordability and affordable housing. Only issue is that uh, in the past there have been others in which uh, 
conversations been around in terms of what should be done. Not to say that ESR would not continue to do that, but it makes me feel better to know that there's something in writing that binds. So if, in fact, at whatever time something happened, that there's accountability to be held there. So that's just the, the stance that I'm coming from on that. Okay. Is there a motion to move it forward without recommendation? Move. So approval. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Those likewise. What we have done, we have made a motion to send this to the full city council, which will meet next Monday night, without a recommendation, so it will be on the general agenda. And at that point, I'll call on Ms. Weldman to address the issue that was brought up. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. And oh, yeah. In that same sense, I would ask that um, staff go ahead and prepare something that um, had that in it so that we could ask mm -hmm. her at that time if she agreed mm -hmm. that that would already be done so yeah. it wouldn't have to come back. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Ms. Brooks, thank you. We'll now go to C3. You could read that, please. Item C3, resolution authorizing continued use of funds for the New Century Individual Development Account Program by United Way of Forsyth County Incorporated. Mr. Brooks, I hope you didn't go too far. Nope. I'm here. If you could give us a two-minute introduction to this as well, please. Yes, this is a request for United Way to continue to use funds that had been allocated for the individual development account. Uh, for down, it's, the money is used for down payment assistance, and there is a remaining balance of a previous allocation that's eighty thousand dollars. They intend to submit a new request for funding, and there's a match. Uh, required, they uh, are requesting to use the $80,000 balance as part of the match funds, and they will match, I'm sorry, they will match that dollar for dollar uh, to continue to provide down payment assistance to individuals that uh, go through this particular program. Okay. Ms. Burke, do you have any questions? Yes, I just thought when we have agencies who are asking for certain things that we bring before the for the council, mm -hmm. and I didn't have any problems with that, but it's just to inform the public what we're doing. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, if I'm in order, if nobody just wants to say anything, oh, motion. Ms. Uh, yeah, Adams I has a question. question. Mm -hmm. um, again, I saw the map with the dots that tell us where the IDA housing is. Again, I need data like how long this program has been in existence and how many people within the city of Winston-Salem, I know they can buy in the county and stuff, but I also need to know how many people in the city of Winston-Salem benefit from this or benefited, and how many in the county uh, have benefited from this. Uh, again, I don't have a problem with it, but I always see things like, okay, the level of funding allows 80 uh, households but if we're doing 80, how many have we done up until this point? You see what I'm saying? Track record. I'm done. And my question is similar to Councilmember Adams. And looking at the, where the, the, the purchases have been made, have the dollars that we've given been used outside of the city? Mm -hmm. Or are those other dollars? Or are those actual dollars that the city has put in being Can used? Can we bring that map up on the screen for yeah. the folks? Because we're going to ask that is, uh, I know they're using the county individuals in the city, and I know county has programs, but if you live in the city, the county won't use some of their dollars, and these are housing finance assistance funds, mm -hmm. which come directly out of city dollars. So I have a problem if we are spending those in the county because the county doesn't spend their money on housing dollars in the city. And the information in response to one question states since the program started in 2001, it has provided 517 IDA home buyers with down payment assistance. So 517 individuals have been assisted. Uh, where exactly, I don't know if there's a restriction that city funds only be used for individuals in the city. That's information I would have to get and bring back to you. Yeah. Yeah, just looking at the map, that will be on the screen in just a second. There's not a lot of them, but there are few. There are one in Kernsville, uh, looks like two in Louisville, and yeah, a lot in the unincorporated areas. Let me just wait and see if we can get this mm -hmm. map up.
I'm not sure that works, Mr. Chairman. They're going to check and see, but I'm not sure you can count on that for the day's meeting. Okay. We will just go the old-fashioned way. Y'all look in your yeah. book. Um, Chair, on page 90 of the uh, part of the appendix for this, yep. it says the program information, uh, you do not need to live in Forsyth County to participate in the program, but you do need to purchase a home in Forsyth County. And that kind of goes back to what Council Member Montgomery was saying. Uh, it shows the money, I guess, that the county gives, which is 20000 And then we're, we gave $200,000, and it's 80000 left, and they're wanting to use it for this program. Again, I'm concerned when I saw the dots that are the monies that we're investing being used you know, for the citizens of Winston-Salem. I don't mind sharing, but if the county's giving 20 and we're giving 200 out the gate. Mm -hmm. That's a bit much. <laughs> if, if I could suggest to the staff to maybe take a look at the percent of money that was given to, to residences within the city limits and without the city limits. Can we yes. get that? We'll have that for you before okay. Monday. Yeah, Mr. I just want to make a comment about using past data to think about where we're going with this funding for the next couple of years. During the downturn and immediately after the downturn, really the part of the market that got hit the most were first-time buyers, the kind of people that this um, program will help. And we saw, through the Board of Realtors, we saw many fewer people coming into the program because they just knew they couldn't afford a house or couldn't qualify. So I just want to be careful that we use, we use real numbers, maybe go back a little ways, not just take the last two or three years. Okay. And, question. and as well, um, I don't know in terms of what the county piece is, but I know just going back to that point and what I referenced in terms of the county don't sp not spending theirs, I think because some of their dollars they request, they request it specifically for the county. So that's why they don't spend it within the city. But because these dollars are not federal dollars, they're not CDBG dollars, but these are housing finance assistance dollars that come directly out of city mm -hmm. taxpayer dollars directly, uh, we really need to pay attention to those dollars being spent back in the city of Winston-Salem and not outside in the county. Okay. Is this time sensitive or can we hold this for a month? It says the grant that, the grant that they're applying for, I think, is October 27th. That's the date I remember. Yeah. Says this, says these funds will not be awarded until early September. But I May believe that's information we, on that particular question, we can have that for you before okay. Monday night. Okay. Can I suggest we uh, get a motion to move it forward? And I think we can have that information for us. So moved. Second. There's a motion second to approve the motion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed likewise. Abstentions. Abstain. One of, that's three in favor, zero opposed, and one in abstention. I'm moving for it to go forward. Yes. Yeah. That's what we did. The motion was to move forward. One, okay. Next one is C6. Item C6, ordinance amending the project budget ordinance for the city of Winston-Salem, North Carolina for the fiscal year 2014-2015. This one I request to be pulled. I'm not sure who to address this to. Greg, you're kind of the transportation area. We have this $15 fee that's split up into three parts. This is a fee that you pay for your car. A third goes to transit operations. I'm assuming that money goes to support WISTA. Yes. Mm -hmm. A third is sidewalks and greenways. I would assume that went in to support sidewalks and greenways. Technically, it's non-motorized non, uh, vehicles, but yes. Non-motor vehicles. Okay. And the third one is traffic calming or safety projects. Those were the three categories. Correct. My question on page 138, it says since July 2011, 89500 in grant funding has been appropriated for the Winston Southern Forsyth County Child Obesity, Obesity Initiative. Is that coming out of this funds, or is that a different corky dot? Councilman Clark, that's a different funding source. That, that's a, that's it has a, nothing to do with the, the no. first page then. Okay, no. then I have no questions. It came from the K, KBR Foundation. Okay. You didn't, if you'll notice on page 137, you have a bold print. Uh, category, and then you don't have another bold print till after that corky dot. That's why I assumed it was part of it. It's not. That's fine. I'll uh, look for a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed likewise. 
Miss Burke, did you ever figure out what the other one it was? It was eight, not nine. It was okay. doing the DOT. If I don't hear any objection, we will pull C8 that was a previous approved and talk about C8. If you'll read item, that, please. Item C8, resolution dedicating fee simple right of way to the North Carolina Department of Transportation pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 168-274. Okay. Mr. Borling, are you here? Would you come up, please? Burke, did you yeah, I question? just want him to speak about that. Can you give us two minutes on this one? Okay. Um, as part of the Harper Road project uh, out in the Clemens area, uh, a sewer line and pump station are being built out there. And the pump station, lift station, is uh, on Harper Road. And as part of that acquisition, uh, NCDOT needs a 10-foot dedication of right-of-way for the future widening of uh, Harper Road. And this is one of the conditions that's been placed on the construction of the lift station is that this dedication of land be made to NCDOT for future widening of the road. Okay, thank you. I just wanted for the public awareness okay. to know what we do as a city. Okay. Could I then get a motion to approve both C8 and C9? So moved. Second. C9 was the minutes, so yeah. that should be non-controversial. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed likewise. So those are approved, and that finishes the consent agenda. We will now go to the general agenda. There are five items here. We'll do uh, G1 first. Item G1, information on the community agency funding application process. Could you give us a general introduction of what we're changing here, because this is a very even though we're, we're talking about here more specifics, the mechanics, this is a fundamental change in how we allocate some funds. So uh, actually, you've got a, looks like a nice handout yeah, for you. Here. I teed you up nicely. <laughs> you did. Let's see here. Uh, good afternoon. I good promise afternoon. to move you through this purposefully. So shouldn't take too much time. Yes. Uh, these are the items that we're going to review. We're just going to review the current process, why we're changing the process, the proposed process, and any questions that you may have. This first slide actually highlights the process that we currently use. That's in this current fiscal year. Um, and you'll see, right now, you'll see two different columns. You'll see community and business development, and you'll also see budget and evaluation. Those are actually how we receive our request currently. And the biggest difference that you'll see, if you look under grants included, you'll see under CBD, see Community Development Block Grant, that's the funding mechanism, uh, Home Improvement, I'm sorry, Home Investment Partnership, Housing Finance. On the budget and evaluation side, where we receive ours, you'll see that the funding mechanisms are general fund, occupancy tax, and housing finance. We move on down and we look at the timeline, uh, you'll notice that under CBD, everything's about a month ahead of everything that we received through the Budget and Evaluation Department. Uh, the purpose and the reason for that is the CBD has federal deadlines that they have to meet. So therefore, they're usually pushed a month ahead of ours. I'd actually like to highlight one particular deadline in particular. That's that February under the timeline for CBD. You'll see the application deadline there is February. For us, it's March with everything that we receive through budget evaluation. Those are just some of the highlights in, as far as the differences. Uh, and what you'll notice by this is that it's, there's not a lot of consistency right now in the current process. Why change the process? First reason why we're changing the process is that uh, council requested that staff take a look at the process to come up with a possible new solution or some other recommendations to improve the process. Um, and what we're trying to do as far as staff is actually develop a more structured and consistent process. We want to open it up to more agencies, and that's one thing that the council had requested, uh, incorporate more citizen involvement, and also 
what we're trying to do is solidify the funding for the manager's proposed budget. Try to get it done a little sooner if possible. What you see here this is not an org chart. It's actually a flow chart. Uh, the biggest thing that we'd like to highlight here and the newest piece of this is actually the allocation committee portion. Um, in the next slide, I'll actually explain the allocation committee and what the, the purpose or intent of that is. The allocation committee is a 11 member committee and it's composed of nine citizens, one representative from the transportation advisory committee and one representative from the continuum of care committee. Uh, we have these nine citizens. This is in response to having more citizen involvement in the process. Uh, the citizens are appointed by the mayor and the council members and we've also included and we wanted to use uh, City of Winston-Salem University graduates as part of this process. This just goes further down to show you how the allocation committee uh, is going to help form uh, review panels. And there will be an allocation member, a part of each review panel. This is actually the structure of the review panel that we're actually proposing. Uh, as you see right now, currently, we're recommending that we have an arts and education panel, a human services panel, community and business development panel. There's an A and B to those, which are actually kind of consistent with the current process with what they do, and also a SOAR panel. Each of these panels, you'll see two staff members and three citizens. And again, those citizens are uh, appointed by the mayor and council. And you'll also see one City of Winston-Salem University graduate as well. And this is a, the review process continued. Uh, we have the job access reverse commute JARC, and we also have the continuum of care, which again, that's going to be consistent of one City of Winston-Salem graduate and five members, actually experienced members in this, these particular areas. And these are a few that we highlighted. Um, anyone with a social work background, veteran affairs background, things of that nature, just because of the technicality of this particular review committee. Our timeline. Can I ask a question there? Yes. Are the citizens that are on the allocation committees different than the citizens that are on the proposed review committees? No. You'll, They're different. The citizens? No. They're actually Let's see here. If I'm on the allocation committee, there's nine, is 11 members, nine citizens. Yep. Are, do those people also serve on these other committees? Yes. Yes. Okay, so you could serve on, one person could serve on the allocation committee as well as maybe two of these panels. That is a possibility. Okay, good. well, there has to be because there's more yes. positions. There are more panels positions than there than are, are allocation. Yes. Okay, thank you. Question on Go ahead. this is also the same for even though just continuum care is listed here, that would be for every one of the panels would have the same type of subcommittee or the same type of structure. The, the same type of I'm make sure I understand the your same, question clearly. Yeah, continuum of care, emergency shelter, and what this will look like here. But yes. this is, is an example of what would exist for the other as well, or is this just for this just, just for just for continuum of care. The others aren't as large; they're on the exactly, page. Right. exactly. Okay. okay. This is our proposed time frame right now, um, and again, this is actually an informative session. We're actually looking to inform you with hopes of moving forward um, due to our time constraints. Uh, October, you see, we're going to begin the marketing process. Um, November RFP applications are going to be available. There will be a kickoff workshop. Um, also, in December, we have our application workshop again, and then a, the deadline is set. Uh, February, we begin our allocation committee orientation, where staff's going to go in and actually give an orientation for all the allocation members, train them so they understand what the process is, what their job responsibilities are. Uh, February, we're going to start the panel scoring. So you'll have the review committees. They're going to actually score 
the applications. Uh, those scores are going to be moved to the allocation committee and they will review and make their submission to the manager and actually the finance committee. You see here we actually have the public safety committee as well and in May the city manager proposed budget. Uh, that's just a brief overview. I'll take any questions that you have. And when do you plan on imp implementing this? We are prepared right now to get started. We we needed the blessing from the council before we move forward, at least to inform you of the process. And we have enough time to get it ready for this upcoming budget uh, 11 months from now. Yes, okay. we are ready. Questions, Ms. Adams, you have questions? No questions, comments. Uh, Mr. Brooks, you and your department. Mr. Page, great job. Uh, Mr. Garrity, great job on this is what happens when we work together and we all bring something to the table that we can make better our process. Uh, I can say that after reviewing this, I am very satisfied with where we are right now. I see we've also taken a page from the United Way and Smart Start and those other agencies because this is basically the format that they use. Um, I think, again, as you know, I'll say this is a good first step at us becoming better at this. I think the community will embrace it and see it again as being fair and just that everybody's expected to come to the table uh, with the necessary tools and I'm glad to see we have a workshop and I'm just so glad to see we have input and fresh eyes from other people in the community with different uh, expertise as well as the graduates of our Winston-Salem University. Good job. Mr. Bessie. I just wanted to make sure I'm reading the chart correctly. Um, you have the allocation committee, uh, and on the left, it looks like you have the subcommittees of the allocation committee. So, and on the right, it appears that you have separate boards that are, are feeding into the problem. We, we actually have, I guess those committees are, in, it wasn't intentionally put that way, but that is kind of the case. Okay. Um, because some of those have processes that are already working very well, they're already in place, we're like, we should probably believe them be. Yeah, but <coughs> the um, Transportation Advisory Committee is, is a multi-jurisdictional exactly. entity that has a much broader exactly. you know, uh, field of purview and, and responsibilities. Uh, and so if, if the only way I could read that is, well, it also has you know, a a voice in this process by our taking you know, one of our folks that's on the Transportation Advisory Committee also asking them to serve on the Yes. Oh, okay. Just one more. Now that would be a council member or the mayor. Is it your intent to have elected officials on any of these things? It was not our intent. Staff. You can have staff. Mm -hmm. Could you have because on yeah. Transportation Advisory is it's you and you and James. James, that's right. James. <coughs> um, in, in that, if I may? Yes. In that case, it probably should read um, the, um, what's it, TCC? TCC. TCC. Yeah, yeah, instead of the TAC. Right. Because yeah. that would be the staff. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other? Yes, sir. Mr. Montgomery had a question. Mm -hmm. A couple of things. Um, this is actually one area that I was very adamant about. Um, last year and, and in past in terms of the process that we use um, being equitable across the board in terms of how we deal with agencies and what we request of agencies to provide when they're looking at funding through um, through our budget process. A um, couple of questions that I do have and I think are, that are important is particularly the individuals that are placed on the actual um, allocation committee in my opinion, it is very important for those individuals to be well-rounded individuals within the community because by looking at these areas that we look at, um, it's important for them to, uh, they may not have expertise in all of the areas, but to be well-rounded enough to understand the different factors that play and, and come into it. And as you no know, will be appointing that rather through the mayor's office and, and council, uh, but as we review that, I think it's very important for us to look at at that factor in that process for those individuals um, based upon what they look at and recommendations. On the panel score process, um, it'd be important for me to, to see at some point in time how we're scoring and what we're actually scoring 
them on and how those scores will be allocated for those individuals. Uh, one thing that I mentioned in process and it came out of what is looked at during the process for the uh, CDBG dollars is in reference to our communal goals and the goals that we have as a community and making sure that the agencies that are applying for certain funds are actually going to help meet the goals that are being established. I know that that's part of the CDBG process, but as we look at the greater piece of this, making sure that organizations are, are meeting, meeting some goal and actually accomplishing something collectively um, in, in their actions. Um, so that's also a piece that's important as well. Okay, Ms. Burke. Mr. Chairman, uh, through the years we've looked at this, mm -hmm. and I'm very pleased that uh, all of us who've had input, staff, council people, former council people, <coughs> but in looking at it and talking about it, we've not had anything concrete like this. So I would like to commend our vice chair for saying, let's make this a project. And now this is the results of the project, and uh, I want to appreciate that. Okay. What's the total dollar amount this group's going to be working with? We have a few. Um, I know what's coming through budget, which is roughly this past year, I think like one million fourteen thousand. I'd have to look at a million bucks. That's close yeah. enough. Okay. Do we need a motion to send this forward? What do we need here? Information. Just a Just blessing. Yeah. <laughs> They'll bring it back. Is Go it, forth and send no more. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a motion that we uh, endorse this uh, concept and uh, direct staff to implement it? I move that we endorse. I was going to say I second that. That's a good All right. project. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed likewise. That is endorsed. With those comments. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yes, sir. Just a, a suggestion. I know Councilmember Taylor has been particularly interested in this area. He may want to a chance to give it his blessing as well. It might be a, a good thing to include on the consent agenda for. for oh the, yes, I would assume it would be on the. Yeah, we can be. It, we wouldn't have a resolution. We can put it on Monday night's agenda. Yeah, for, please do. Okay. Okay, we will now go to G2. Uh, if you'll read that, please. Item G2, resolution authorizing an extension of the terms and conditions of the city's financing of the sale of city-owned land to Brookstown Development Partners, LLC, and an extension of the city's lease back of the subject land. This was originally on the... Um, Agenda was it two months ago? Yes. Mm -hmm. Which I was not here for that meeting, and there's addition, additional information put in here. Uh, Ms. Saunders, would you mind just kind of reviewing everybody, remind us what we're talking about? Not at all. Good evening, uh, Chairman Clark and members of uh, City Council. Um, the attached resolution um, is requesting authorization to it extends the terms of the uh, Brookstown development, um, well, the financing of the sale of land for Brookstown development, and also extend the lease. In June of 2009, City Council authorized the sale of city-owned land to Brookstown Development Partners, and it was part of the mixed-use project around the ballpark. Um, the city financed $980,361 over five years. Interest-only payments at 5.5% were made in year one and year two. Um, 25,000 principal were made in year three, four, and a payoff was to be made at the end, which is where we're at now. The balance outstanding is $930,361. They have asked for an extension of exactly the same terms as the original agreement was, um, five years um, with principal payments being made again in three, four, and five, and the payoff to be made, which would be... Um, Eight hundred eighty thousand, yeah, eight hundred eighty-five thousand three hundred sixty-one dollars in two thousand nineteen. At the same time that um, we received payment on the land, we're actually leasing the land back at amount equivalent to the annual interest payment. Um, we've also attached in Exhibit C um, questions uh, or responses to City Council questions so, that came so from Brookstown okay. Development Partners. We sold the property, leased it back, and mm -hmm. financed it. So, That's correct. Mm -hmm. okay. And the interest payments is exactly the amount of the lease payment. And it is, and of course the principal would be on top of that then? Correct. And payments are current? Yes. Okay. Questions, comments, Ms. Burke? I'm just going to ask a question again. Yes, ma'am. Who is, who are we talking about when we say the Brookstown Development Partners, LLC? I believe I asked that question last time. <laughs> Did I ever get the answer? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I right, tell it again so we have it for this Brookstown time. Development is a limited liability company 
Billy Prem is the manager of that company. I don't have a list of all the members of the limited liability company, but it's a single entity um, for the purpose of the development around the ballpark. They basically own the land. They have no they employees. Do. They don't have any employees. Yes. It used to be a council person, Ernestine Wilson, to be chairman of yep. finance also, and she would always ask, and it is good to know, you bring these projects into us, you give us a broad name, but we don't know who we're doing business mm -hmm. with. LLC, and when you would say et cetera, and she would say, spell it out to us, mm -hmm. and I can see why. And I think when taxpayers are investing their money, they need to know who they are doing business with. So, Mr. City Manager, just as we've tried to fine tune and make the, what we do with these agencies a little clearer, and then other folks have asked about dates to know, looking back, like Mr. McIntosh just finished, and of course, Ms. Adams, mm -hmm. would you please, I don't need to have to say this anymore. Oh, All right, thank you. Okay, Mr. Uh, McIntosh, you had a comment? This does not affect the amount of money the city receives at all, does it? Just lengthens the term. That's right. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Montgomery. Uh, my question is the same question I asked back uh, last month mm -hmm. when this was discussed in reference to the use of property. I see it in terms of saying here the use of property is a mixed-use development. Mm -hmm. um, and the question that I brought up then, and it wasn't a part of the deal initially, and I still have that same concern in the sense that if, in fact, the mixed-use, which mixed-use can entail housing, that if housing is a part of the process, is there any intention of anybody having any affordability in the housing that is present there? And that's something I don't see in here, and that's something that, in order for me to support this, I'll need to understand before I can support it. And are you speaking of the land that's in question? Mm -hmm. In terms of it's looking to be used to develop mixed use development, um, and, and I know my colleagues are probably tired of me saying affordable housing, but every time it comes up, there's going to be something that I'm going to no. going to bring up because for me and anything that we do, because uh, if they could get this deal at a bank, they'd have gone to the bank to do it. And so they come here because it's something that they probably can't get at a bank. So because of that, my, th my position is what else do we get out of the process? Yes, we'll get a development that increases tax base, but also what is another greater benefit for me if housing is a part, which it doesn't have to be, but if housing is a part, I'm concerned about what is affordable in that process. I think what they've said to respond to just this particular piece of property is that the intent is that it most likely would be sold for retail use, but if, but if it were to be sold for housing use, that they would make every effort for it to be affordable housing. That's what I read here. Ms. 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 Burke had her hand up. Yes, when people say things like that, we need to have things in writing. A bank, a business, big business men would just have a joke with some of this stuff they hear coming out of our mouths. <laughs> they would they put you out of business, they fire you. That's exactly what they would do. Um, the last time, and I'm going to get this cleared up, when, I, when we brought up the same project, we also brought up GOLA. And the same comments that Councilmember uh, Montgomery had about affordable housing and what they had done, and I said to the city manager, sitting here that day, you had uh, everybody. Then when I get to the council meeting, now this is one thing about this head, it's still thinking real good. And it's not a thing I'm missing, thank God, mm -hmm. right now. And um, I said, now, do we have any projects that we're doing like this? I was told that I was not aware of that. It was as if though I was being unkind to somebody. Only this city manager evidently heard me, and he did not repeat it to the person. But everybody was present, and someone called me and said, you asked that question twice at that finance meeting. Do y'all remember that now? Yes. Uh, over there, y'all, re you remember? Yes, ma'am. All right. And we got to the council meeting as if though it had never been asked before. Now I want to tell you, I want, who gave, Mr. Page, would you answer a minute? Answer the question today. The question that you were asking, Councilmember Burke, was not the question that I was answering. The question that you asked when we had our conversation after the committee meetings was, has there ever been any extended period where we've required additional years beyond the term of the loan to have affordability? 
The answer to that question is no. We've never had any additional. The question I answered was, do we require affordability? The answer to that question is yes. But, and as to the restated question when we had our second conversation, or after the third conversation was, do we require any affordability beyond the period of the loan term? And the answer to that question is no. And then the reason I bring this up, uh, City Manager and Mr. Page and the Mayor and Council people and Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman of this committee, as long as I've sat here, and the Mayor probably sat the longest with me, uh, being an employee and then being the Mayor, I've always said, let us be, what word I use, start with the F, fair. <laughs> if we do it for one, then we need to do it for the other. And what we said to Gola, I'll ask another question. Have we done anything like that before, like what we did with Golder? Because what Mr. Page was kind enough, he sent me a whole list of those developments and what we had invested. And for instance, one was 10 years. I said, now explain this one to me. Did we say with those 10 years, then the next 10 years you would have to do? The one that said 20? I said the 20, the next 20. So I'm asking some questions. We have never had any beyond the term of the loan. I'm satisfied with the answer. We may move on, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> sure we got it. Again, I, I was not here for that meeting, oh. but let me, let me ask a question then. Uh, to me, this is much different than the recent Goler vote we had. Oh, no, I'm not talking about that one is not with Goler. I, I was talking about another list that he sent me. Oh, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. I, that's your list. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we recently. Uh, did some financing with Goler, but that's being forgiven over a 20-year period, if I'm not mistaken. 15? 15 years. 15. Like. Yeah, yeah. To me, this was, we just sold some plus surplus property and financed it. They're paying, and then we're, we leased it back, and our, their interest payment equals our lease payment, and then they're paying us the principal at 25000 a year. Yeah. And they really don't know what they want what can do with it because of the poor real estate market right now. And they're simply, I'm gathering we're still using the facility. Uh, and they're simply asking to continue it for another five years. Is that correct? Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. You're right in your observation. The reason I brought this up, this was indirect effect and something that happened with Gold. We were oh, talking okay. about developments. And I wanted to make sure that the record would be cleared up that GOLA is the only one that we have given loans to, that we have put that for the next 15 years for the affordable housing. Is that correct, uh, Mr. Page? Yes, ma'am, that is All correct. Right. Okay. That's what I want. All right, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Adams, you had a question? A yes, a comment and a question, I guess. Um, in the response that Mr. Prim sent us, yeah. you know, I can respect that, but again, to note, as we move this city forward to be a better city, when we have conversations with businesses and companies that want to develop in our city and they want to build housing of any type, and then as we know, they're going to come and ask us for their, our assistance, which is the taxpayer. We need to now be in conversations, whoever the staff and the people at this table with these folks, we need to think about the diversity of our city. If we can't, my years on the Housing Authority Board was like seven, if we can't diversify our communities in every respect, not differentiated by incomes and station of life, then we're not doing what we're supposed to do. I think these are conversations that we now need to move forward on. Everybody that wants to develop downtown and charge the high rent and the high sale those people, if they're coming to us, and Mr. Garrity, I'm not talking about hostage or anything. I'm just being real. We need to have those kinds of difficult conversations that our downtown needs to mirror our community. We got development going on downtown every day, all day. And my question to us at this table is, and I talked with Mr. Clark about it. I've had the conversation with the mayor and some others. What are we doing with the inner city? In one breath, we say we don't want to build a gated community downtown. Well, I beg to differ because we are doing that, people. I mean, our intentions are to increase our tax base. But again, 
when we have these types of requests coming to us, we need to study them before they get to us now that we've changed the format of how we receive information for requests to give us a chance to dig deeper. There needs to be a concerted effort that we request that they build some diversity into their development. That's uh, Mr. Montgomery, you have your hand up. Yeah, I did. Um, and that's the sole reason why I consistently talk about affordable housing. Um, and I think Councilman Adams captured it quite clearly. Um, and I know they say that they're not certain on the type of development that will be placed there. But if you look at the area plans, if you look at the current development in the area, mixed use in that area looks like commercial on the first level, residential above. That's just what it currently looks like. Mm -hmm. They do something different than that there. To me, that will go against what I think will happen in that area. So at times like this is important because we may not have leverage in the future, and this right. is our opportunity to have leverage on what development happens there. Will that stifle development there? I'm not exactly sure. I think the only development community can really say that. But I, in my opinion, or what I view as including some type of affordable, it doesn't. Uh, but to me, I think that has to be a part of what we look like. And just as a pin to uh, the point that was brought up by Ms. Ms. Burke, which is aside from this, the reason in conversation with the Goler piece is my first request with the Goler project was that we put in the um, request that that first 15 years of the request that they be affordable in that extent. And it was felt by the developers in order to get financing that that would stifle them to be able to get the financing in the initial piece. So in order to get the financing, they needed to spread out the affordability over a longer period of time in order to make sure that they had the support from the finance, from those who would be financing the project. And that's the real reason why that one's a little bit more extended than some of the others. Mr. Uh, McIntosh. I, I do think we need to be careful and make sure that we don't saddle this piece of property with, with uh, conditions that'll keep it from being developed. I, I agree, I mean, I think the, I think looking at a phased, partial, some component of it, it makes a lot of sense. But I think we need to be very careful that we don't interrupt the development process and make, and make this a piece of property that, that no longer works for development. Yeah. Yes, Ms. Burke, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it seems like this is the time that maybe we need to, to say some things. Uh, when we talk about the involvement, I have been saying women need to be a part of a lot of things that we do, and we are not putting them into the economic uh, mainstream of things. And yet and still, if you go back and look at some of our projects, you will see some of the same uh, good boys been doing the same thing. But they don't bring in blacks, Hispanics, women. And Mr. City Manager, this is really a charge to you. Because you see us up here, we're speaking, and there needs to be more conversations about how we get involved. Now, somebody wants a bond to pass. Now, I don't have to go to all these churches and tell them why, if I think it should or should not pass. But when you look at some of the things, we had to struggle, some of us, even to get the fairness to make sure all these wards would be given what was right. These are all the tax dollars of all the citizens, no matter how, what the amount. And I'm going to say again, we just want fairness. That's all we want, fairness. I'll make a comment. Lee, do, do we want this property back? Do we need it? No, no long term, we don't, we don't want yeah, this yeah. property. It is, it, it is an ideal property for development. It has great views. Uh, it, 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 once the economy picks up, um, it will be very developed. Yeah. I guess my, my comments as is, is chair is we're asking questions of the wrong person. Brookstown Development is not going to develop this property. They accumulated all the property around the stadium and they'll sell it to anybody that wants to write a check. Uh, and they haven't sold but a little bit because as you know we've been through a very difficult recession. Uh, but we're asking this person to, if, to build affordable housing when most likely He's not, and he'll sell it to, if you want to put a grocery store on it, he'll sell it to you tomorrow for a grocery store. Uh, we sold it to him and leased it back. We're using it on a short term. Uh, I, I'm kind of coming down where Ms. McIntosh is. We're, we seem to want to put a requirement on, on something that a guy's not going to do. This, this, this company has no employees. 
no intention of developing and hasn't ever developed any of this land. Please let me finish. I'm going to let you finish. Uh, but if we don't renew it, we may get handed the property back. I don't know. But we don't want it either. We have a developer that came and said, I'll take, try to do something with this property, but I kind of need to accumulate the different sections of it. We went through a great recession. This isn't the first person. How many times did Goler come back to us for a renewal? Three or four or five times? Forever. And we hung in with them until they, uh, they had the group, I think they're out of Atlanta now, that, that came up with the last good plan that we approved. Uh, but we hung in with them. And I think the property around the baseball stadium, it's going to be a couple more years before anybody's interested in it, just because the economy is still kind of struggling along this, that, and the other. But I, I'm kind of perplexed here on what to do here uh, because the, the person that's going to develop this land isn't at this table, and it, we don't even know who it is yet. Uh, the question is, we had some surplus property that someone was willing to buy from us. Do we want to keep renting and let him pay us and, uh, a little bit of principal and pay the interest on it? Uh, so, so I'm, I'm kind of at a loss on where to go forward with this. Yes, ma'am, go right ahead. I'm going to help you with that. <laughs> I'm not not going to support this. I support, I'm going to support this, but I'm saying, just like I said, with our new process for people, uh, nonprofits coming to us wanting money, we got to look at this differently than the way we're looking at it now going forward. I'll support this, but I'm saying I don't expect Mr. Prim I know that to be the one to make that decision. It, he addressed it. I respect him for that because he has no, no say-so in it. But I'm saying when we are dealing with whether it's a Mr. Prim or any other developer, those, that conversation needs to be held, Mayor, up front. Mr. Page, Mr. Garrity, it needs to be held up front. And then we'll know where we stand versus they bring it to us and, and again, we want development, and I don't want anyone to think that we're trying to hold Brookstown hostage right now. We've been saying, having this conversation now for over a year or two, that this process, too, is going to change. It might not be right now, but eventually, the way this comes, it's going to have to change. We're going to have to have those conversations, and with that, I'll move, I'll move forward. For, for I'll second the motion. Right. Okay. There's a motion to second. Any questions? Mr. Montgomery. Come, I'm adamantly opposed to it. I won't support it as it stands because I think we're going to miss an opportunity at this state to ensure if housing is built here that there is some sense of affordability in the future. Yes, Brookstown won't be, may not be the ones who develop it, but we can put in this as, as financiers and refinancing this some type of, of deed restriction, not to say that a certain requirement, but that it forces whoever it is to come back to the table and have a conversation about what exists there. And to me, we're missing out on an opportunity. We can talk all day long about making sure that we have affordability. But if we turn up the opportunity to do that, how committed are we really to that? And I'm the biggest supporter of economic development uh, to, to see it moving forward and try to keep as many blockades out of the way of making it happen. But if we're going to be committed in any way to making sure that affordability is there, if they build a grocery store there, fine. They don't have to worry about that. But if they build housing there, that's something that we need to be cognizant of. And if we move from the opportunity to impact that, I think we're missing the boat on being able to have impact. That's, that's my biggest thought on this. Okay. We have a motion and a second on the floor. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Uh, abstain. It passes three to one. Uh, thank you very much. We will now go to G3. Item G3, consideration of items relating to an economic development loan. A resolution approving economic development loan to West End Mill Works LLC and B ordinance amending the project budget ordinance for the fiscal year 2014-2015. We do have Mr. Anderson who has signed up uh, and I'll give you a chance to speak in a minute. Just uh, bear with us. Uh, Mr. Page, this was up last month and I think you got held in committee. We got a little more information on it. Yes, sir. That's Can you just board. fill us in again? Last month it was just for informational purposes based on direction that committee provided last month they asked to bring it back. This is a request from Western Millworks LLC, which is made up of two local individuals, Mr. Dewey Anderson and Mr. John Bryan. I think they're both here today. Uh, they're requesting a $195,000 loan from the city 
that would be part of a phase two development for Western Mill Works. The $195,000 would be in conjunction with a bank loan as well as in conjunction with a loan from the downtown Winston-Salem Foundation. We'd be in a subordinated position. Our cost would be about 15%. Based on the investment in phase one, which was a little bit over $1.38 uh, $1 million, is projected the phase two will be about a million dollar investment. Phase one has nine businesses, created 100 jobs. All of them are locally owned and operated. And the majority of them are minority and female owned. It's recommended that if this loan is approved, that funding will come from the Dell Repayment Fund um, as part of the economic development infrastructure improvements. I okay. think Mr. Anderson and Mr. Um, Brian are here to answer any questions. Yeah. Do y'all have any comments you'd like to make or just answer questions that may come up? Okay, thank you. They're here. The owners or the developers are here if we have questions. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Burke. Since Mr. Page said they will be majority uh, females and minorities, could you answer that question to one of them, please? Ms. Anderson, could or would one of y'all address that? If you'll come to the microphone. And if you'll please give your name and address for the record. Uh, Dewey Anderson, uh, 232 Shawnee Street, 27127. Uh, John Bryan, 211 East 3rd Street. Thank you, gentlemen. Along. Can you address the issue of, of who has been in there so far and, and who they are? And sure. Uh, Ms. Burke's question. The majority of our tenants, um, and it, there's a series of buildings and parcels within the development. Um, we've been working on this project since 2010. Uh, it's been a very um, incremental redevelopment of, of um, the side in the buildings, given uh, their location, it's in a formerly um, industrial submarket close to Haynes Park, um, and very much, you know, kind of um, functionally obsolete is the real estate term for the real estate. Uh, and what we're trying to do, and, and the way that we've always uh, looked at it, was initially a, as a historic preservation effort. Uh, the core building within the site is um, one of only five. Uh, roller mills within the county that are st still surviving um, and we were just um, actually successful in getting it on the National Register but uh, the second part of it was um, we look at it as, it a, as an economic revitalization effort for the corridor uh, and it's very much community based so uh, the nine businesses that we have within 840 Millworks which was 918 Bridge Street um, is a combination of um, uh, retail and, and uh, amenity businesses, all um, locally owned and operated, and again, the, the majority of which uh, uh, are um, owned by females um, and minorities. Well, I'll tell you, Mr. Chairman, yes, Go ahead. before I vote on it, there's nothing wrong with it. I just need a little clearer of, of it. And Mr. Yes, Page, if somebody can give that to me, and I may even write down by the Oh, Please we'd, love, sure, we'd yeah. love to give you a tour. Absolutely. Actually, I believe in the, and I do not have my reading glasses on, so I'm trying to read this fine print I, here. I saw it here. Isn't there a list of the businesses? Yes. 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 The porch is a Tex-Mex sent by a woman. Well, a, we can't all remember that. If you could just, whatever page it is in here, if you could just put who, who, not necessarily the name, but description. Can you, somebody give me a page? What page, page 28. 28. Page 28. Again, it's printed so small I can't yeah, I read it. Uh, one, if y'all could print that a little bit bigger, and two, if you could just give that information, uh, have it ready for us for Monday night, and Mr. Page will get up with you. Sure. Okay. Good questions. Any other questions, comments? Yes, sir. Comments, just about the nature of the project. Um, the area that these projects are taking place in is an area of town that people have driven by and sort of written off for the last 20 or 30 years. Um, mill buildings, warehouses that were in a pretty bad state of, of uh, repair. Um, but it's also the, and, and so they're bringing vitality back to that. Other people are looking at starting businesses in the area. And so it's, it's, it's touched off a real revitalization effort. But the other thing that, that always impresses me is this, you talk about sweat equity. Mm -hmm. You go down there pretty much any day of the week, you'll see these two guys down there working on this project themselves. I mean, it's a real grassroots effort, small business, uh, minority owned. It just ticks off so many of the boxes that we, that we really want to encourage in the city of Winston. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Is there a motion? Move for approval. Second. 
Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed likewise. I just abstain until And moment. one abstention. So we have three in favor, none opposed, and one abstention. Thank you. Thank you. We will now go to G4. Item G4, presentation of the Winston-Salem Police Officers Retirement System actuarial, actuarial report as of January 1st, 2014. And I'll give the introduction on this since I am the, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. what am I, the liaison to the committee of the ex officio committee. <laughs> All of our city employees fall under the state retirement plan except our sworn police officers. Right. <coughs> need one. Lisa, we need a couple more Wait, if you got them. Two more. Two more. Okay. As I was saying, all of our city employees fall under the state retirement plan except our police officers and while we're not going to cover it tonight uh, the state retirement fund is one of the best funded retirement systems in the country I think if I read correctly we were second in the country among the 50 states as far as the, the wellness of the program uh, many many years ago we broke off and put our policemen under a separate and locally run retirement system we do have our uh, it's actually an actuarial firm, firm that does the analysis each year based on generally accepted accounting principles mm -hmm. to report back to how we're doing. And we just got this report last month for the fiscal for the calendar year just ended, and I've asked Ms. Saunders to present it for us. Okay. Thank you. And I've given you a very detailed presentation that was presented at the Winston Salem Police Officers Retirement Commission meeting in August. I'm going to point to the pages we need to go to and go to some very high level because it gets it's pretty detailed That's in fine. there. But um, the report basically includes the um, Winston Salem Police Officers Retirement System, which was established in 1977 for the benefit of our police officers. It also contains our separation allowance plan, which was mandated by the state in 1987 of which we um, contribute to, and that provides payments to police officers to sort of bridge the gap until they reach age 62. So with that, if I could get you to turn to page three of your report, we're going to look at just an overview of the, um, what we refer to as whispers, which is the, the main um, plan. And if you'll focus on the two middle columns, and the, the actuarial reports are required to be done on a calendar year basis. So the most recent one that we just received the results on is the January 1, 2014, which is the third column, and we're going to be comparing that to the January 1, 14, and comparing it to the January 1, 2013 column. The first line is what's called an actuarial liability, and think of that as the total amount that's due to every police officer today in the plan and all of their benefits that would pay out their retirement to the end of an assumption of the, of the mortality. So at the end of, um, or at the beginning of January 1, 2013, that number was 148 million. At January 1, 2014, it was 153 million. That changes because you add police officers, you give them increases in pay. Um, that, that's an example of why that liability is gonna um, increase over time. So it's been about a $5 million change. Mm -hmm. Under assets, the, and look at the smooth line. We had 91 million in assets in 2013 versus 132 million in assets in the plan. It's January 1, 2014. That's a $41 million increase. If you remember, we issued limited obligation bonds in August of 2013 to pre-fund the plan. And the additional amount would be investment earnings um, in the plan to increase it by $41 million. So in January 2013, the plan was funded at 61%. After we um, made the $30 million contribution plus investment earnings, the plan is now funded at 86%. That's considered to be a very healthy plan. Um, our goal was to fund 85%, so we're doing actually a little bit better than we anticipated when we issued the limited obligation bonds. The next line down is what's called the unfunded liability, and that's the difference between what our total projected liability is what our assets that we actually have, and we were at $57 million unfunded at, two, at January 1, 2013 versus January 1, 2014, we're at $21 million. So we're closing that gap um, over time. The next line is what's called the city contribution. That's annually what the city is required to put into the Winston-Salem Police Officers Plan. And by policy that you've adopted, you've committed to funding it by that every year. Um, when we brought the, um, the revisions to the Whispers plan and we did a soft close to Whispers 
and we were going to issue the LOBS. There was a commitment by City Council to keep that level of contribution at $6.1 million every year. Um, in January 1, 2014, you can see the required contribution actually has dropped to $3.3 million. But you have to remember you've got about a $2 million debt payment that you make on top of that, so that brings it to 5.3, and the excess just goes into the plan to continue the funding of the plan. And we're going to look at a chart later on that shows you how quickly the plan will be 100% funded. Um, and then the last line is just payroll. Um, at January 1, 2013, those numbers represented, or the contribution represented, an amount of 24.1% of payroll. This drops it down to 13.4% of payroll. So um, you'll go to the next page. This is one that we don't often actually look at, but I think it's, it's good just to take a quick look of the separation allowance. And again, this represents the amount that a police officer is going to be paid from the amount they retire until they reach age 62. And this is mandated by the state that we actually make these payments. So they're held in a trust um, as a defined benefit for police officers. And, and there's not a lot of volatility in this plan, so you're not going to see a whole lot of change. So I'm not going to go through a whole lot of it other than it, it's about $16.6 .6 million is the total liability at January 1, 2014. Your contribution has been right at a $1 million um, for a, a fairly significant amount of time, which represents 4.4% of payroll. Um, this plan is funded about 52%. So um, it's, it's, funded, it's funded well, um, and the, the contribution is, is fairly stable. If you remember, we pre-funded the previous plan to help stabilize the contribution. This one is not nearly as volatile. And it's not near as many dollars either, smaller plan. Yep. yep. Okay. Um, next, if you will turn to page six, um, and I'm just going to go through. The actuary did this little chart, and I thought it was, it put it in a little more simple terms about things that, that make a difference, decisions that you make or, or other um, factors that can actually change the liability of the Winston Police Officers Retirement Plan, the Defined Benefit Plan, um, what can help it, what can hurt it. So the first column represents factors. And then they've got at the top more than expected, less than expected. So for example, your investment in performance, our um, assumption is we will have a 7.5% return. If we get more than a 7.5% return, it helps. That's the first column. If we have less than a 7.5% turn, it hurts. The next column is salaries. You sort of have to think in opposite terms of what you normally have would be. Um, more than expected salary, in other words, if you give more salary increase than the plan expected to have given, it actually hurts the plan. If it's less than, it helps the plan. Same thing with retiree longevity. If a retiree retires sooner than you anticipated, it's going to hurt the plan. If they live longer, it's going to hurt the plan. You know, it's just these assumptions. If it's less, it helps the plan. Um, and that uh, same as retirements. Retirements. They actually hurt the plan. Less than expected helps. Terminations, they actually help the plan because the officer left. Um, if they're more than expected, if we have less, then, it's, then, it, then it hurts. And then the disabilities, there's, there's you know, no change one way or the other. But I just thought it put it in very simple terms, things that actually can affect your actuarial liability of the plan. And the last thing that I want to go over is on page 10 which really gives you an outlook of where we started and where we've come and where we expect to be. Um, now, I've mentioned that the assumption of, one of the assumptions is, is that we would have an assumed rate of return of 7.25% in investment results. We actually had much better than that last year, and our average over 20 years has been a little bit better than that as well. So that's a very conservative, it's a very good estimate for the Winston Sound Police Officers Retirement Plan. But if you look at the red line, that represents the unfunded liability, which we talked about before being 57 million and it went down to 21 million. And then the blue bars represent the funding level, which we were at 70 and we're 62 percent, and now we've gone to 87 percent. So what this chart tells us, if we meet our investment results or our investment return, then based on that pre-funding and us continuing to put that 6.1 million dollars into the plan every year. We're going to get up to the high 90s fairly quickly by 2019, and then by 2028, the plan will be 100% funded. So we're, the plan is very solid, um, and I think this is um, 
good news. And I'll remind everyone, starting this year, new hires are not coming into this plan. They, we have a, a defined contribution plan. Right. So it will be curious to see. That there's oodles of assumptions that go into this. The average age when someone retires, how long they live, how long their spouse lives, what investment return we get, what's inflation, just all sorts of assumptions. And you, you hope that if you're off on one, you're off the other way on another one. Mm -hmm. But we'll know in another five or ten years how it's starting to look because no one else, no one knew is going into it. And as folks leave the plan, we'll see how, how we do it. Anyway, Ms. Burke. Since we're talking about retirement benefits, I'd like for the city manager just to make a statement. We are very, what to our police, we are not mistreating them. No, we, we are very good to the officers as far as retirement. We always have been. Thank you for saying mm -hmm. that. Okay. Because somebody gets a little bit of information as if though we're the nine, mm -hmm. but we've always tried to be out front. Okay. Mr. McIntosh. The fact that we're at 86% mm -hmm. funded liabilities does not in any way say that we can't pay 100% of what we It's actually pay. very good. Right. So my question is, what's the, what's the motivation to get to 100%? I and mean, what do we, by increasing that from 86 to 90 to 95 to 100, is there, a, is there a payback for us to we, we well, make money It's on a that? closed plan now. So over time, it's going to totally pay out. So we would right. beat our advantage. I mean, we, we've got to get to 100% to pay okay. out the officers. All right. okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have the entire council here at the moment, so I don't think we need to include this in the uh, items for Monday night. But I did okay. want everybody to know that I do sit on that committee, and we take very seriously our charge to be sure it's funded. And, uh, Everything's on the right. As I said, there are probably very few states that are 86%. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll now go to G5, if you'll read that, please. Item G5, request from the Children's Home. Mr. Page, and by the way, this, uh, Mr. Taylor, thank you for coming tonight. We're going to be finished. This is the last item. So I think we'll be finished, if not by 6, just a few minutes thereafter. We'll be as patient as we need to be. Okay, thank you. Mr. Page, if you'll kick this around. I'll uh, get it started for you. Earlier this year, you actually approved a resolution, and in the resolution, it required that the children's home on its loan use the entire children's home property to collateralize the property. The council approved the loan with that request, with that condition in there, that the entire parcel owned by the children's home had to collateralize the loan of $300,000. Um, the state has actually gone back based on the value of the property and they've changed their condition such that only the cottage itself, which was the original purpose of the program, is collateralizing the loan and they have gone back in and changed their condition as well as changed the funding source. We do have to change the funding source under because the current programs that are being operated there don't meet the home condition guidelines. Um, Mr. Ware from the Children's Home is here today to actually ask you to reconsider that condition and allow it to just be collateralized with the cottage itself. And we'll talk about the new program that's been operated in the cottage. That new program, while it doesn't meet the home guidelines, is a program that's going to benefit high-risk adolescents. But he's here today to make a request of you all to reconsider that condition. If you all want to reconsider the condition, we can bring an item back or resolution back um, next week to actually modify it. But I think he's here to make the appeal to you all. But we, we have changed the, I think it was two or three months ago, we changed the how we funded it. Right. We haven't done anything We yet. haven't done anything. No. Okay, so we still have to do that. Then, look, I mean, I'm hearing two questions or two issues. One is to change the, the buckets that we pulled the money from, and the second one is what is the collateral for the loan? Correct. Okay. Which really the question for him is the collateral because we have to figure out the bu We will then make the bucket change, which becomes housing finance assistance funds. Otherwise, the only other option was if he's not willing to, or if the Children's Home Board is not willing to change the condition, the only other option is going to be to call the loan in default. Okay, any questions for Mr. And I, I'll get you just a second. Any questions for Mr. Page before we get Children's Home folks up here? 
Yes, sir. Go ahead. The funding source, again, it helped me because I remember having this conversation. Um, and was there another item that we switched funding on, we did. on yeah. with this property? Because I, I remember adamantly we had this conversation we before, yeah. but did we not vote on it or was we, it you, just? You, you all did a vote on it. You did approve it. We've not done it because it requires their consent to do that. Up to this point, their board has not consented. And they're back asking if we would modify the condition that was imposed. Okay. So, so we did make the decision yes. make before the decision. to change it, but it just hasn't been uh, done. It's just, it, yeah, just okay. a collateral It's issue. just collateral is the issue. Okay. And so uh, what I don't see here is the actual value of, of the cottage. What is that value? Yeah. Sir, if you could come up, please. I'd, we have the uh, executive director of the Children's Home. Sir, if you give your name and address for the record, then we're going to ask you all sorts of questions. Marie Swear, 1001 Renault de Road, Children's Thank Home. Thank you. What? The value of the cottage is $1.2 million. That's the tax value, price value? Last tax value. And, mm -hmm. and we, we have a loan, and so does the state and some other folks. Do you have those amounts? You want to go up there and tell them. <laughs> Can I ask? <laughs> yeah, 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 sir. This, the state has the first loan, which is 500000 and then the city, of course, has the $300,000 second. So you have the, the state's property. in first position, we're in second. Correct. Okay. You have the floor. I know the original. Good evening. Thank you. I appreciate it for having me here. I know the original concern was the stability of the children's home and why you secure the entire property. Um, there was some sense that we may be going out of business within the next 90, 90 to 120 days and the whole fragility. Well, I, I stand in front of you um, properly saying that we are in a much better financial state, first of all, than we were this time last year. Secondly, that the children's home is being ran more like a business now. Um, it was a nonprofit, feel good, great mission, and people led with their heart. They didn't always pay attention to the piggy bank. I'll just be quite frank with you. We have scale financing that is helping us completely organize our finance department. You have myself and a great board who truly understands the product, which is good treatment that we are producing for the at-risk population in the triad to the point to where Centerpoint has named us a preferred provider for intensive in-home in the Cashman area, as well as the Winston-Salem Forsyth County School District has named us one of only six providers to provide services in their school district. So I think that speaks to the confidence of where we are in the product that we provide. And quite frankly, we're still here. Thank you. Do you have public financial records? Yes, we do. Yeah, I would like to see your latest. Okay, okay. Ms. Adams has a question. Yes, thank you. Um, again, welcome to the city. Thank you. Um, yeah. We've had some concerns, uh, not just the council, but the city as a whole. And now you're here to help us uh, understand it. What else are they doing besides the, this uh, initiative? I know the farm, I think there's something going on Great there. Volunteers who. Yeah, but can you give us a, a, a small capsule of what the children's home now is doing and maybe what they're vision is a mission going forward because right now all we know is this and this hasn't really been in the paper or anything we do know about the farm right and we know you closed the doors and you did some other managerial things but what is the future looking like for that uh, property and organization okay right now we currently have i'll go through the programs that we have that are in and of themselves turning a profit we have foster care, traditional and therapeutic foster care that we offer for the Western North Carolina area. We also have a great relationship with the school district where there's Kingswood Alternative School is on campus and we provide treatment to the roughly 80 kids on campus, on site, in real time. We also have intensive in-home where we provide services in the community for at-risk families and youth. We also have a great partnership in, and last year we serviced seven schools. This year we're up to 10. We provide therapy in the elementary level, which is big because I think we all can think back to kids in elementary school and we knew then, like, they're not quite right. And as we watched them grow up, it was like, yeah, we knew something was going on. 
or we, we're on the prevention end of it as well to spectrum. We also have therapists in downtown Health Plaza in Winston East. So those are our major programs. What's happening right now is that the biggest thing is that we're being to be ran like a business. And I, and I think that's critical. Um, you all know the history. I've been here 17 months. And great mission. It started in 1909. Again, as times changed, the children's home was slow to adapt from the orphanage model to a true mental health behavioral health model. Nobody's fault, it's just what it was. But now we're at the point to why we have to catch up and we're doing it. I mean, we're in great conversations with Baptist Hospital about some possibilities, uh, collaboration. Um, we really have a lot of great partners. So if you talk about what the strategic plan is for this year, to maximize our services, to make sure we build for our services, and to make sure that we understand that the product, which is good treatment, however heart tugging may be, that we can't give away the product. We've been known to provide free services, and there's room for pro bono. But if that is your product, GM does not give away cars. They might need to. Well, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but the bottom line is, you know, that's your business, and you have to protect that. So, you know, to really talk about the shift, we brought in folks from out of state to trade the entire campus to understand therapy and what that looks like, and that everybody is responsible taking care of kids. I had custodians and secretaries. I don't do this. Yes, you do. So that's the shift in the culture that we're making. So this year's goal is to maximize our programs, understand that we're a business, build for our product, and then right now we have new six new board members coming to board who are energetic, who really get it, who are connected to the community, and who are determined to move us forward to the point to where we're going on a site visit as a board and as staff to look at other model programs around the state see where we match up well, see where we need to improve. So the commitment is there. So those are things you can't put in the paper, but we are going to celebrate our founders. They have to get a plug in. Founders Day is this Sunday, Sunday, September 14th. And it's just the time to get back to basics, review the mission, and chart a course for the next 105 years. One more question, Chair. Are you utilizing the whole campus at present or just part of it? I would say just part of it. We have the farm and the farm volunteers and our kids are there. Do you, that encompasses maybe 60 of the acres. Do you think going forward eventually you will possibly utilize the complete campus? That, that would be my goal, yes. I was trained in residential facility in Michigan where we utilized right around 140 acres. We had a pond right in the middle of campus. So beauty is a silent teacher. So yes, my goal would be to fill all those empty cottages up, have about 240, 250 kids running around. But Riley has to help me out with that, too. Right now, the shift is community-based programs, which is why we're heavily involved in the school district, because instead of waiting for what Riley's going to do, we'll go to where the kids are. Very good. But it's that balance that you have to maintain. Thank you. Okay. Let me address this to you and to Mr. Page. Is this a time sensitive? Do we need to do this this month, or can we? I would love to. Um, OK. Just, just because we've, we've been in yeah, okay. waiting mode. Because there's two things I will, that, that aren't in here. One, I'd like to see your current financials just to confirm that you're more financially sound. And two, I would like to see the actual plat of what the collateral is, specifically how much land is associated with it. Yeah. Because I certainly understand, when if, we got, if we were going to get a lien on everything you got, that really restricts anything you can do. So I understand that, but I want to be, the state's a little different than us. State's in first position. They got money. Uh, and there's a real estate man sitting right here, but I, I guarantee that building wouldn't sell for 1.2 million. Mm -mm. But it might sell for 500 or six, 700. So the state's going to get paid. But I, I would be amenable to reducing the collateral, but I would want some land to go with it. Just, to, yeah. but certainly nowhere near the 100 plus acres you've got. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah, Miss Burke. I was going to say, when it was an offer, some of our finest citizens who decided to stay in Winston became very productive. And, and then when you talk about some trustee board people or board members, maybe getting some board members who were energetic, and then reaching back to some of the folks who did complete their lives and telling their story. Because it's been one of our beautiful places. Mm -hmm. It's in the North Ward. Mr. Bessie. Yeah, I, I may have been the person who originally suggested the modification to the term. Yeah. Uh, and if my memory is correct, um, I, I was. Um, and I just thought I'd, I'd explain 
my thinking behind the, the suggestion and why I support maintaining uh, either what we passed originally or some strong form of it. Um, uh, I certainly support you know, the Children's Home's mission and I, I respect the work that Mr. Ware is doing at this point to you know, strengthen its, its status so that it can continue to operate. Uh, at the time, it, it appeared uh, that there was a great deal of community speculation on whether right. the, the Children's Home would stay in business at all. Um, uh, and if it were to shut down, I agree uh, with Chairman Clark that, that whatever the tax value may say, we would be unlikely to have the city taxpayers protected in our position uh, simply on the cottage. Uh, and I think that that continues to be true. Uh, the other thing that was a concern um, uh, of, of mine was that, you know, this facility um, with its, you know, uh, open space uh, is in a unique position uh, in, uh, in value to the community. Uh, and given the size of the city taxpayer investment, uh, I thought it only reasonable that we ask for a, a voice in how that large facility were used if in fact it were split up and part of it was sold for development. I still think that's appropriate. Um, not, a, uh, not necessarily as a way of saying no we're not going to approve that but as a way of saying that we would have a voice in the shape of it. Um, and as a, as a, uh, a steward for the op continued to operation and hopefully thriving of the children's home, I would assume that they at some point would have to look at the question of do they want to retain the entire 100 plus acres as valuable as that real estate is today, Very valuable. or uh, do they wish to um, sell part of it off for some kind of private development? And if, if the latter becomes the case, I still think it's appropriate that the city's taxpayers have some, some voice in how that is developed. That, that was my motivation, and that's you know, my suggestion to the committee for your consideration. If I could because my time is up, uh, recommend that we hold this in committee because I think that, that this is too complicated, I think, to come back at the meeting. But I would suggest that staff meet with the children's home folks. The house sits somewhat by itself there when you yeah, go in. It's true. on the right. Yeah. I think you could break the house off and maybe some of just the small acreage right. in that yeah. area that would provide us ad adequate capital uh, or Covered. Uh, lever not collateral sort I'm looking for, excuse mm -hmm. me, not capital. Uh, you know, you put the Christmas tree. Right. I know you got the animals and the donkeys that sit at the Christmas tree. So. <laughs> Sits on the lawn. That area is right in there. Right. So I think the staff could, if we if we give it a couple weeks, I think we could come back with something that would be in both of ours, protect okay. our interest, yeah. and, and would not overly encumber you. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, just to Councilman Des Bessie's point, um, I, I completely understand the, the position that Councilman Bessie's uh, stated, just for a record, I want to say that uh, I think the principle that Council Member Bessie stated is the same principle that I stated on one of our former uh, 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 items that we voted on tonight in reference to thinking ahead in terms of our influence. So I okay. think that. Thank you. Okay. That's okay with everybody. I have one more item just to mention very quickly, and then we're going to adjourn. Uh, Mr. Bessie and Ms. Adams and I were at a meeting the other night. Uh, Ms. Saunders, I'll address this to you and a uh, person, a uh, citizen brought up, they had to go downtown and buy some building permits, and we had a limit on how much they could put on a credit card, and I told her I would suggest that we look at it. Uh, I think it was $2,400 or $2,500 per credit card. Uh, it's my understanding when they do the credit card, they go ahead and check to see that it's good. So I would think that we could raise that amount and still be well protected. Uh, probably more so than with a, a check, which you have to wait two weeks to see if it's if it's good. Yes, ma'am. Is it the city that has the limit or the park that has the limit? This was the city. The city. Yeah. The, the city. city has a limit. Huh. But if you could check on that for us and just report back appropriate time. Okay. But a card also has a limit. Cards have limits too, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, but usually if you're good, they keep raising that limit uh, as you yeah. keep spending. But uh, with that, I thank everybody for hanging in there. And Mr. Taylor, you'll start in five minutes or so. Public safety will convene in five minutes. Five minutes. Thank you. We're adjourned. Um.